We're now um, heading to the home stretch here. Um, what we'll do is essentially have a, a final part on, on metaboanalyst. Um, and I think uh, this isn't a complete coverage of the entire uh, software suite uh, or web server suite. Um, there's many things that, in fact, we'll not have time to look at or are too complicated to show just through, a, I guess, a, a demo or a slide. As I say, one of the best ways of learning software is just using it or playing around with it. And um, there's a lot of software uh, or a lot of um, data sets that you can upload or, or play with in MetaboAnalyst that allow you to do that. But I think the other part is this uh, tutorial that, that we've given you, uh, if you. If you take the time to download it and, and spend a little bit of time playing around with it, I think you'll find it should be fairly easy to follow. Uh, again, this is just to highlight what our schedule is here. Um, we'll be doing MetaboAnalyst, and then we'll wrap up with sort of a, as I said, a blue sky view of, of where metabolomics is going, or maybe going, or maybe not going. Um, what we did for the first half in part one uh, for MetaboAnalyst was, was really look at um, the statistical approaches. This is where we are taking our, our set of metabolite lists and, and our, um, uh, or if they were raw spectra, and, and converting those, those lists to shorter lists. And, and that was a combination of the step one, step two. The step three in, in metabolomics, uh, as we've shown before, is this idea of taking those short lists, those important metabolites, and then trying to interpret them. And I'm going to focus on a few different applications. One, uh, it's called enrichment analysis. Uh, another one on pathway analysis. Uh, and then another one on biomarker analysis. I am not going to have time to talk about time series analysis. I know someone has also inquired about that. And then I, I won't be talking about power analysis. And then there's another one of the eight modules that can deal with things like batch effects and other correction. Um, now, this one module on, on enrichment analysis, or we call it metabolite set enrichment analysis, or MSCA, um, is, is really uh, modeled after something that's been used for many, many years in, in genes transcript analysis that's formally called gene set enrichment analysis. And in order for gene set enrichment analysis to be really useful, basically it has to link uh, gene lists to pathways. Um, and uh, Ingenuity Pathway Analyst, or IPA, um, is famous for what it does uh, through gene set enrichment analysis because of the set of pathways. So for a metaboanalyst to do the same thing for metabolomics, uh, it meant that we had to spend a long time building up um, both data sets, libraries, and pathways that would be making this useful. So uh, about, I guess it's five or six years ago, we compiled a list of, of metabolite sets. Um, and these are grouped into a variety of disease sets as well as pathway sets. Originally, metabolite set enrichment analysis was um, a standalone program. I think it's still active. You can go straight to MSCA. But we've integrated into MetaboAnalyst. And so it uses some of the, the better, newer features that are now with uh, the R modules. So metabolite set enrichment analysis can be broken down into three components. One is called over-representation analysis, or ORA. Another one called single sample profiling, SSP, or quantitative enrichment analysis. And we're going to go through um, each of these um, in a little more detail. Um, the metabolite set enrichment analysis uh, particularly, I think, as it relates to quantitative enrichment analysis and single sample profiling, um, is largely limited to uh, human, human or mammalian systems. Um, the over-representation analysis is simply, uh, it can be used for most any types of things. The point of enrichment analysis is, as I say, in this third and fourth step in, in metabolomics, which is to take your list of metabolites and try and convert that into something that's um, biologically important, something that you can interpret, something that's meaningful. So you're looking for compounds that are significantly enriched in your data. Um, 
And the enrichment we're looking at is enrichment in terms of pathways, diseases, or placement, location, localization. So most of what's in this one is in for humans, but because rats and cows and other critters are, at least mammals are very similar to humans, you can use um, some of this for other mammalian systems. You should not use this uh, for plants or microbes. So for overrepresentation analysis, uh, all you have to do basically is get a list of names of metabolites, which goes back to my point that I've been hitting endlessly on, is that if you can get named metabolites and even just relative concentrations, you can do a lot with that. So if you're only working with peaks, then it's hard to go um, very far with this sort of MSEA. If you have metabolite names and concentration data, uh, it, this technique is called single sample profiling. And this is taking uh, information about reference values, standard reference values for humans, that they're probably somewhat similar to other mammals, um, that allows you to assess whether these things are very high or very low relative to the average healthy uh, human or primate. And then if you have another concentration table with lists of metabolite names and concentrations, you can also, not just for a single sample, but for multiple samples, do an assessment of quantitative enrichment analysis. And this is essentially saying which of these things of your sample of 50 or 100 individuals um, are clearly enriched and how do they align with certain types of pathways or diseases. So over-representation analysis um, is um, handled in SSP and QEA are handled sort of through these three different um, methods. Um, with over-representation analysis, as I said, there shouldn't be any compound concentration, so that's blanked out. Um, so it's grayed out. Probably should have colored it so it's not visible. Uh, but it's essentially using t-test to assess the importance of uh, important or compound lists, which ones are unusually high for given pathways or conditions. The compound concentrations in SSP are compared to the normal references uh, for humans from a variety of clinical samples and from the human metabolome database. Uh, and then the quantitative enrichment set is to go through or we'll look through a whole range of metabolite set libraries that were pre-assembled. And then the output is some kind of general biological interpretation. So as an example, what we're going to do is we're taking an existing data set. Uh, we were looking at um, patients who developed cancer cachexia. There were 77 individuals. Um, and they had two types of cancers. Uh, one type was lung, the other was colon. So there were actually two different groups. And the issue was which of these individuals, they all had cancer, which of those would eventually develop muscle wasting and which ones didn't. And so this is partly a biomarker study, but it was also uh, one we were wanting to see how these groups uh, differed and what was particularly distinct with respect to um, the urine metabolites that we saw in these individuals. So we're selecting this data set. Um, and as I say, it's that test data set, which you can scroll down from anywhere and um, by Roman Eisner et al. Um, and it links to the paper that, that was published on this. So to do an analysis user using over-representation analysis, uh, we'll click here to, to do that enrichment analysis. Um, here, what we're doing is we're uploading just the list of metabolites um, based on the option that we've chosen, which is ORA. Um, and what you're seeing is just simply the list of compounds that were um, identified um, that were uh, either detectable or um, ones that were, in this case, most frequently found in the individuals with cachexia. What we're dealing with is essentially a name list. You can see that below this one, which is open representation, we can see two other bars below, here and here, uh, which are used for quantitative enrichment analysis or single sample profiling. So we're not doing these ones, we're just simply doing this one at the top. 
So if you're working with names, it's actually really important to make sure everything is named properly. And in some cases, people have typographical errors. And in this case, there's an example where uh, the amino acid, I think it was isoleucine, was misspelled. And when it did its name normalization, looking to see if it could find a compound with that name, uh, it couldn't find anything in the HMDB or in PubChem or KEG. So it says either you've made up a new compound or you've mistyped something. So then you can potentially edit it, change the name so it's properly spelled from isoleucine without an E to isoleucine with an E. Here it's actually suggested alternatives uh, to the name. Um, and so you can go down the list to see if it's the correct, correct metabolite. Click on it and now you've corrected it. From here, you can select a metabolite set library from which to compare. Uh, there might be pathway-associated metabolites, disease-associated metabolites, um, SNP-associated metabolites. These are single nucleotide polymorphisms. Uh, there are predicted metabolite sets, location-based metabolites. So certain metabolites are found in certain tissues or biofluids. Uh, you can create your own metabolite set, which you think is you know, defined as being important in cancer, as an example, or a set that you know is important or has someone previously has published or said to be important in cachexia. So there's a customizable data set, which is at the bottom. There's others that we have compiled um, for this particular application. So here it is, you know, a bunch of largely amino acids and things that were identified as being uh, mostly uh, different or um, Again, we're not using any concentration data, but the ones that were differential. And what it does is it essentially plots out, we had chosen, in this case, uh, the top one, which is the pathway enrichment set. And now, based on the metabolites, the ones that we were able to see, the ones that were differential at some level, uh, it's identifying where things are most different. And um, what it's seeing is uh, in red, is the most intense, the most significant ones, and it's quoting a p-value here, um, where we see e exceptional enrichment of these kinds of metabolites in both glycine and serine and threonine metabolism, protein biosynthesis, phenylalanine tyrosine metabolism, methionine metabolism, and ammonia. Um, what you're struck with is, in fact, that most of, this, most of these uh, amino acids or compounds that seem to change are all associated with amino acid and protein synthesis. And that's very much characteristic of cachexia. It's, it's, a, it's a, a problem of largely protein loss and insufficient protein synthesis. So even though we don't have concentrations, we just simply had lists of metabolites that we could see that were different, um, this is immediately pointing to something, to some extent, that we might have expected given the, the etiology of cachexia and muscle and protein wasting and protein loss. We can go down these lists from this uh, overrepresentation analysis and click on things. There are um, table views, and each of these have hyperlinks. And then, of course, the table gives you the frequency of the number of hits of metabolites corresponding to the pathway. So the pathway might have 20-some metabolites. We got nine out of those 20-some. And the odds or probabilities that you would actually have those hits, um, there's an expected value, there's a p-value, um, false discovery rate. So we're doing statistics, if you want, on, on the frequency at which these things might actually occur within these given pathways. When we click on the view, here is the list of the compounds that are known to be in the phenylalanine tyrosine metabolism list. And you can see that the ones that were differentially uh, expressed or measured uh, include acetoacetic acid, fumaric acid, tyrosine, phenylalanine, phenylpruvic acid. All of those were in this, in this list. What's also linked to this is a, a pathway, uh, in this case to a small molecule pathway database talked about that before. And this highlights um, the compounds um, that were altered uh, through over-representation over analysis. And you can see in this case, this is what's going on with um, the phenylalanine tyrosine metabolism. So over-representation analysis is actually a very weak form of doing um, 
pathway analysis. Uh, it's just giving you as an example. It's arguably the easiest one to do because all you need to do is, is provide a simple list of differentially changed metabolites. Other one that's a little more powerful is to do single sample profiling. And this is basically uh, what you would do if you were analyzing a single individual and you're trying to determine whether they're sick or healthy. And so you might be taking out a, a profile, metabolite profile of an individual. Um, and here, instead of just providing a list of metabolites, you're actually providing a list of metabolites and their concentrations. And you have to indicate whether it's you know, blood or serum or urine or wherever. But as long as it knows what type of um, biofluid it's working with, and as long as it knows that it's, it's human, because this is what it's going to be referencing, uh, it will do essentially a concentration comparison. So for each of the compounds that are in there, um, it will provide a list of um, the known or relative concentration ranges that are expected to be normal um, and how far, whether things are significantly off and um, abnormal or, or normal. You can then further view these things and this is just a case where we're looking at um, levels for threonine with the, these in, this particular individual. Their readout in urine was something like 90 micromolar. And the information that's been collected on, on humans in urine over the last number of years, there's four studies that were published. Uh, all the values that are typically reported are somewhere between 20 and 40 micromolar. So this individual clearly has abnormally high threonine levels in their urine. And it's not just compared to against one study, against a whole collection of other studies. And then in, you know, the references and the study are, are provided, so you can make some assessments. So this is typically, as I say, for a single individual. And you're trying to use the large library of, of reference concentrations that are found in the human metabolite library. If you go to uh, the other method, which is method number three, now you're looking at a population with a whole bunch of metabolite concentrations. Um, and in this case, um, we'll be indicating names and concentrations. Um, in this case, it's got a sample data set that you can upload, and that's what we've done. And this um, is taking the concentration data that we've we've provided it with um, and produces a table not unlike the overrepresentation analysis, uh, at least from this sample, and it identifies again the number of hits to the different metabolites. We've actually scrolled down near the bottom here, we're not near the top, but it's giving based not just on the incidence of names but also on the concentrations estimates of the p-values and false discovery rates. And you can go further in and, and explore to see how these things are are the same or different and, and to associate them with um, collections of metabolites that are associated with those pathways. So this one is more robust than the overrepresentation analysis by, by simply name because it's actually using concentration sets to, to calculate things more quantitatively. So this is pulling pathway information out. Um, it's, a, it's a simple test. It's very quick. It gives you some statistical information to say whether this is relevant. But what most people do, and I think what's largely superseded now, um, metabolite set enrichment analysis is this pathway analysis tool. Um, so as I say, enrichment analysis tells you which diseases, pathways, other things are, are, are modified. This one is largely more focused on pathways. Uh, but it looks not just at the association of the metabolites in pathways, but also considers the pathway structures, whether metabolites that are being changed are representative of hubs or spokes in the pathway, whether they play a central role. And rather than just being restricted only to humans, uh, as the overrepresentation or MSEA is, this allows you to look at things from 21 model organisms. So, uh, you can look at things like E. coli and yeast, or you can look at, at Drosophila, mouse, or humans. Now, in order to do this, we actually had to borrow extensively from the CAG pathway database. And as I brought up 
before, the CAG pathway database is exceptional, but it is limited to catabolic and anabolic uh, reactions. So it doesn't have many of the signaling pathways. It doesn't have the Warburg pathway. It doesn't have a, a lot of uh, immunomodulatory pathways. It doesn't have any disease pathways. So in that regard, the pathway analysis module in, in Metaboanalyst is, is missing some important information. We're working on updating that, and we hope to have in another six months, or perhaps sooner, a large collection of pathways uh, covering maybe not 21 model organisms, but at least, uh, at least a half dozen major model organisms that uh, provide a much more diverse and complete set of pathways relating to things like signaling and disease pathways. So in this example, again, we're going to work with the cachexia sample. These are the 77 people who had lung and colon cancer, some of whom eventually developed um, muscle wasting. So this is an NMR-based urine test. So again, NMR-based metabolomics um, and working with lists of compounds and compound concentrations. So if that's the data set that we're using, we've now selected the, the pathway analysis module. Uh, we can upload our data. Um, in this case, it's the example data set. And by clicking Submit, the data is uploaded immediately. As with everything, um, if we're going to be doing detailed analysis with at least this kind of information from multiple cohorts, we will have to do data normalization. Uh, so the, the idea of, of scaling, transformations, um, and these are the sets of uh, auto uh, or, or scaling functions we've chosen. Auto scaling, we're not going to do any log transformation. Uh, we'll be scaling to a reference sample um, to help make this uh, more meaningful. When initially we tried working with this data, we tried scaling to creatinine. And since people with cachexia have serious creatinine disorders and are losing muscle uh, through uh, the de degradation, uh, and eventual production of creatinine, it was all wonky. So we had to normalize using a different approach, and this is how we normalized a, a reference sample. Um, we could have actually normalized to the total organic content or the refractive index, but when this study was done about seven or eight years ago, that wasn't common practice. So these are the parameters that are preferred overall. You'll find that it produces a nicely uh, normalized distribution. Um, and here, because we know we're working with humans, uh, in this case Homo sapiens, we can choose our pathway library. Obviously, if you chose the wrong pathway library, you'd end up with something that's meaningless. Um, so from this stage, once you've chosen the correct pathway, we can start looking at the network topology analysis. In this case, we're using all the compounds in the, the pathways, um, and we're doing both a, a global test as assessment and a relative betweenness centrality assessment. So what this is really doing is it's trying to identify um, information, not just about which compounds are enriched in a pathway, but which ones are important topologically. So there are hub and spoke kinds of pathways, uh, there are also bottlenecks where things might be flowing all down into a particular central metabolite. So in this case, what we can see, there are red nodes uh, that have, or are decorated by these white uh, balls or circles. Those are called hubs. And then there's a thing we call a bottleneck, which is essentially a node that connects uh, other nodes. And again, this is a metabolite that might represent uh, something that if, if something is altered or affected, it will affect a lot of other things. So in graph theory, um, assuming everyone's taken it, um, there are measures of, of, of how these things uh, look, both in a graph, and there are terms that are used, degree centrality and betweenness centrality. And this just sort of illustrates this. Um, so the hubs have high degree centrality, and the bottlenecks have high betweenness centrality. 
And generally, the ones with higher between the centrality perhaps are more important, but it may depend on the, on the given pathway. So every pathway in CAG or any other database that's expressed in Biopax format or CAGML format uh, can be topologically analyzed. And so every metabolite has been for all of the 21 model organisms so that we know which ones are uh, hubs, spokes, bottlenecks, and all of them have been ranked or scored on their centrality, whether it's betweenness or degree centrality. So with that information, when we upload our data for uh, pathway analysis, um, this is what you get. It's essentially a bubble plot. Um, on one axis is what's called the pathway impact, which is a, a general score uh, indicating how much of the pathway has been or is perturbed by metabolites. Uh, and then we have an indication in terms of the negative log P, how significant this, this is. So you've got 10 to the minus 2, 10 to the minus 4, 10 to the minus 6, and 10 to the minus 8. And again, based on the frequency of um, the metabolites that have been detected from this list, and it's a smallish list of around 45 or 50, and the size of the keg metabolome um, pathways, which are probably represent around 2,000 different metabolites, you can come up with an estimate of how likely these things, based on a random sampling, should you see them uh, in a given pathway. So something that is way up in this corner that has both a high pathway impact and a very high p-value or negative p-value um, is something that's very important. And so if we click on this particular one, we see that it's the glycine serine uh, threonine pathway, uh, particularly uh, glycine serine three in metabolism. This is the CAG network for it, so it's not a standard CAG pathway, but it's one there where we've got some topological information. And then you can see some metabolites are sort of way off on spokes, but here's one that's very close to a bottleneck, here's one that's very close to a bottleneck. So these are the things that have been dysregulated. Um, and the coloring scheme allows you to assess how much they have been changed or dysregulated between those who developed cachexia and those who didn't. Um, yellow, less so. Um, deep, dark red, more so. So it's not just simply how many of these things are showing up, but it's where they're showing up, and it's also measuring their concentrations. So that information is all used to assess the pathway impact, but also to calculate a log p-value. And in some cases, sometimes you'll have something that has more of a pathway impact, but a lower significance. Here's one where there's a relatively high or modestly high pathway impact, but no statistical significance. So these are colored from white to yellow to orange to, to deep red. And then the size of the Balls also are used to help assess uh, the number of, of metabolites that were um, found. So this one has relatively large numbers, these small balls, relatively few. So um, we can zoom in to these pathways. Uh, it has a navigation toolbar, so you can scroll right, left, zoom in, zoom out. Clicking on them will produce a box and whiskers plot. Notice, as CAG always does, it doesn't give you the name. It gives you a CAG identifier. By clicking on it, you can now see what the compound is and see how it differs between cachexia and non-cachexia. So as I say, eventually, these will be all replaced by SMPDB paths, and they'll be a little more explicit and a little more obvious. So the pathway impact is a, a, is a measure, it's a general measure, so it's looking at both the change in the differentially expressed metabolites, it's looking at the statistical significance in terms of where they are, the topology. So it's an integrated number. Um, you can also look at these things in a table view rather than just in a graph view. 
And this is a fairly complicated table. Everything that's hyperlinked allows you to explore uh, in more detail. Um, and then there are links to pathways. So in this case, there are keg pathways. We also have some small molecule pathway databases, uh, pathways that are expressed. FDRs or Q values are, are given, um, P values are given, impact scores are calculated. So, as I say, this one has become much more popular than the metabolite set enrichment analysis, in part because it includes more than just simply counting up how many metabolites are in the pathway. It, it, it really assesses whether these things are structurally, uh, physically, um, reactionally important to those pathways. And it also covers many, many more pathways than just humans. It, it, it looks at a number of different organisms. The limitation, as I said, lies in the fact that this is only doing um, pathway analysis on the keg perspective, which is limited basically to anabolism and catabolism. So that's pathway analysis. Uh, another one which is really useful is biomarker analysis. And this is a situation where um, sometimes what you're doing with principal component analysis or PLSDA isn't giving you really clear answers. Um, sometimes that can be addressed by, by going straight to a biomarker analysis. In most cases, when we're looking for biomarkers, we're looking to see if we can find things that distinguish classes, that separate between two groups. Um, and as I highlighted before, when we were talking about this in statistics, we usually identify or distinguish between sensitivity and specificity. Uh, we're going to use rock curves, and it's sort of a yes-no type of answer. So we're not looking at correlational analysis. Um, we have two groups, sick or healthy, um, happy or sad, whatever. And because probably 90% of metabolomic studies are typically divide in that group. This is why biomarker analysis is actually really quite useful. And it can be a, a useful alternative to PCA or PLSDA. And in many respects, it produces a more practical answer than PLSDA or, or PCA. What biomarker analysis does, and that's encoded into this particular module, is to maximize the area under the curve from the rock curve while minimizing the number of compounds that are used. If you're doing this for genes or proteins, it would be the same thing. The reason why you want to minimize the number of compounds used is because you want to have a simple signature, and that if you're wanting to come up with a set of biomarkers, you don't want lists of dozens to hundreds, because it was a pain to analyze. You want a short list, which can be converted into a quick test. So there are three different ways of doing rock curve analysis or biomarker analysis in, in metabolist. One is a univariate method, single variable, single marker at a time. That's generally frowned on, but if you're compelled by your collaborators or supervisor where they just want a single marker, you can do that. The strength, obviously, in metabolomics is you've got dozens to hundreds of metabolites, and so in this case, you'd look at multivariate. It's many combinations, and it'll sort through all the data and figure out which of the dozens or hundreds of, of compounds are actually the most important to create a good distinguishing classifier or separator. And then the third one is essentially manual analysis. And there are some people who think, think they can do better than computers, and so we let them do that. And in some cases, in fact, there are cases where people do better than computers. So you have your choice. In this case, we're going to choose a, a test or selected data set. Um, and as I say, many of these things come with their own training or testing data set so you can see how they work. So in this case, we're uploading this particular one, which has to do with preeclampsia. And this is something I talked about um, last time. So this is an NMR study. We're looking at serum. We had 90 mothers at, eight, at three months into their pregnancy. And in this case, we had 45 who went on to develop preeclampsia and 45 who had normal pregnancy. And when preeclampsia happens at around six or seven months, it's called early preeclampsia. And so this is a very risky condition and where both the risk to the fetus and the mother is very high. 
So we wanted to come up with a marker or set of markers that could predict which women at an early stage in the pregnancy would develop preeclampsia. And if we could, then we could actually start treating it well in advance and save both the mother and the fetus. So when you do biomarker analysis, it's not unlike what you do in a standard PCA or PLSDA. You go through the same tests, you check for the data integrity, you're looking to see if everything spilled out, whether there's any missing values, and in fact there was a small number of missing values. It decided to, to use a default and fill in some of those missing values. It gives you a list of what the data set looks like and if everything is um, right or laid out correctly. And so far all of that seems okay, so we can press skip. And just as I said before, we have to do that scaling, that data scaling. In this case, we're not going to do any, because it's serum, we don't have to worry about adjusting things very much. Um, but we do have to do a log transformation. And the reason why can be seen here. So the data as measured by NMR had some compounds with concentrations that were very high and others with concentrations that were really quite low. The net result was that the distribution of concentrations was very skewed and um, had a non-normal distribution. By applying a log transformation, we were able to convert this distribution into something that looks very Gaussian. And that's on the right. And so you can see the box and whisker plots showing the distribution of concentrations. Um, now it's not as pretty, I guess, is what we saw with that uh, other example with the cows, where everything was nicely lined up. But this still represents a nice Gaussian distribution. It means we can do um, useful statistics with it. So now that everything's been transformed, you can start doing the sensitivity and specificity tests. And so instead of just trying to choose a single marker, uh, so that's the univariate marker one, or rather than doing it by hand because there's so many things that are measured, we chose the middle one, which is my recommendation if you're ever going to do biomarker analysis. So we just click it and we wait for a few seconds, and this is what it does. So it's now produced rock curves, and what it's done is it's automatically selected those metabolites that are most strongly differentiable. So in some respects, you could think what it's done is it's, it's done a PCA, a PLSDA, it's done a ranking, it's looked at the VIP values, it's taken the ones that are moving up in one direction, opposite in the other direction, it's sort of decided which ones are better, which ones are worse, and then it starts generating rock curves for each of those different models. And in this case, it's got a model with two metabolites, a model with three metabolites, a model with five, 10, 20, and 45. Now, obvious as the model gets really, really complex, you get almost a perfect score, but then that's not exactly a set of biomarkers that we want to use, because no one's going to measure that many. The one at two biomarkers, which is red, looks good, but maybe it's just too simple. So it's up to you to decide which combination. How much are you willing to pay, or how much is your supervisor or collaborator willing to um, handle in terms of which markers. Now some of them might be very volatile markers that are unstable and you might say, no, this isn't a good test, and so let's try another one. And here's another one which uses um, three very stable markers which are in high abundance, so that's a better one. So again, it's, it's up to you, but this is essentially has done a lot of the work and it's essentially working out or creating a, an equation uh, with a threshold uh, that, that gives you or allows you to differentiate these two, two groups. So from this, we can select a model uh, from what, that has a, a 95 and plot out the 95% confidence level. So in this case, we've chosen the one I think it's hard to see. It's using only PLSDA data. Uh, it's using a support vector machine. Uh, so that's the model that we're choosing. Uh, and by clicking the display for the 95% confidence, this model is illustrated here. So the line represents the average from its calculations. 
Um, the blue area represents, on one side, the worst performance, um, and on, on that lower side, and then the upper one is the best performance. So this is an example where nothing is perfect, nothing is linear. These are just simply models that have been generated multiple times, um, indicating the overall performance. So when you think of a rock curve, don't think of it as just, just a single line. Think of it as having some width, and this is illustrated here. And the larger your sample, the more complete it is, the narrow that width is. So if we had 1,000 samples or 10,000 samples, uh, it would actually start approaching a, a, a narrow line. So when you're presenting a rock curve, historically people would just draw the, show the line. These days with modern computers, it's possible to show the line with the 95% confidence intervals. Just like with a PLSDA plot, um, you can also select the most significant variables, because right now it's just a curve. You want to know which were the things that were actually being used in this PCA or in this rock curve plot. And in this case, we can see right away that glycerol, 3-hydroxybutyrate, choline, acetate uh, are the four compounds that have the most significant VIP scores. And they're way off the charts, actually. I think they have VIP scores of like three. So these are the, the metabolites that were chosen. And what's more is you can see that one has a red-green and another one has a green-red uh, tendency. So when they are in opposite directions uh, between those with and without preeclampsia, those are very strong differentiators. So that's that little, so those little blocks on the right. And that's just simply showing how, in one case, it's high in, say, patients, and in another case, it's low uh, in patients. And then in the normals, it's just the opposite. So the VIP plot gives you information about what was used in the model. The rock curve with the confidence interval gives you information about how reliable it is. And in many respects, it's a useful alternative. In most cases, a more useful alternative than a PLSDA or PCA plot. Because it generates something that's, that can be used in practice. And this is the sort of thing that physicians are happy to use. Uh, it's the sort of thing that veterinarians are happy to use. It's, it's a biomarker test. Now, it doesn't necessarily give you a lot of biology. Pathway analysis or uh, metabolite set enrichment analysis does. But in some cases, the fact that we are seeing these certain compounds being strongly differentiating also may suggest some, something in, in relation to uh, biology. In particular, glycerol and choline are, are head groups typically found in, in lipids. And this suggests that preeclampsia could be a, a problem of lipid biosynthesis catabolism. And um, there's, I guess, mounting evidence that does seem to be the case. So the markers do hint uh, at possible pathways, but they are also, as I say, very useful distinguishing things um, in a more practical sense than PCA or PLSDA. Now, not everything was covered in this particular um, presentation. I didn't go through time series analysis. Uh, obviously, uh, there are studies where people will look at different times, uh, time intervals, and, and what can be done is using that pattern hunter that we talked about in the first um, part of the talk um, is the one way of doing it. There are other tools that are used. Power calculations, this is used typically in experimental design. Should use 10 samples, 100, 1,000. These days, if you're conducting a clinical study, uh, you can't be funded unless you have done a power analysis. Um, and then another one, which is integrated pathway analysis, where you can work with both gene and or protein expression data and metabolite expression data and integrate those two. Now, I'm not going to show these because they take a long time, uh, and it's fairly detailed. And since none of you have laptops or computers to sort of follow along, um, it, it would start getting quite boring. I'm going to close off because we still have a few minutes um, to talk about something that um, wasn't in the original downloads, um, but to talk a little bit about um, heat maps. So one of the things that we realized early on was that a lot of people were using uh, metaboanalyst 
um, just for heat map generation uh, because getting a, a heat map uh, for free was actually kind of hard. And so people may not have even had any metabolomic data whatsoever. They were just uploading values and running straight into the module to get their heat maps. Anyways, heat maps are used in all kinds of things, actually. Uh, those of you who've played around with gene expression or protein expression have probably used heat maps. Um, but heat maps are also used in epidemiology. Uh, they're used in structural biology. Um, they're also used in politics and environmental monitoring. And uh, we thought that maybe we should modify what's available in, in heat uh, or in metabolic analyst and, and make a tool that's specialized in heat mapping. So this is something that's just come out recently. It's called Heat Mapper. So it's a web server for doing heat maps. And these are just some examples of the types of, of heat maps that it does. So you can see where there's plotting out uh, concentrations or densities of, I don't know, Zika virus outbreaks in parts of Brazil or uh, pollution in, in certain areas around a city. And this is a heat map comparing structural features in a, in a protein, looking at their distances between alpha carbon atoms. This is a classical heat map for gene expression. This is a political heat map, if you want, showing voting tendencies in Canada. And this is another one showing, I guess, an epidemiological um, breakout of, of certain diseases along city streets. So these are all different types of heat maps that you can generate with this one server. Um, so it has a lot of tools for plot customization, which are actually um, borrowed, if you want, from some of the tools in, um, in MetaboAnalyst. And it has these essentially five heat map types. So one is an expression-based heat map. So that's for genes, proteins, metabolites. And that's sort of depicted here. Uh, there's another one which we just call pairwise comparison uh, for general correlations. Um, so if you just want to correlate between different objects. Um, but it can also be done to do um, distance comparisons in structural um, studies of proteins or DNA or ligand binding. Then there's the image overlay, where you might have a picture of a field or of a satellite picture of something, and now you're just wanting to highlight on that satellite image or aerial image um, what is infected or what's damaged. Then there are uh, political heat maps, as I say, where you can show voter preferences or voting tendencies or in epidemiology um, outbreaks in certain regions or counties or countries. And then one which you call a geocoordinate one where you can look at the earth or the oceans and plot out things like temperature gradients or variations if you have that data. So it's a very interactive tool. This is an example of the expression heat map. Um, and as I say, it's for any type of omic data. Uh, allows you to do all kinds of different clustering, distance measures, change the plot size, change the coloring. Uh, you can zoom in and zoom out, um, clicking on things. You can load up different types of data sets, whether it's uh, spatial, sequential. Uh, and then you can save it in various formats, from JPEG, PNG, and PDF. The pairwise comparison uh, is essentially trying to map out a, a, a correlation matrix. Um, so there's lots of applications for this. As I say, we commonly do this in structural biology, where we want to measure carbon-carbon distances uh, between two different similar proteins uh, or within the protein. Uh, but you can also do this for taxonomic analyses uh, in genetics and statistics. Um, they can be very across, um, so you can take any set of variables. Um, so it could be metabolite concentration, salinity, temperature, the same thing can be plotted. So you get a different looking heat map. They're very symmetrical. Um, and we've seen a version of this sort of heat map um, actually in MetaboAnalyst when we look for metabolite expression or concentration correlations. Image overlay, so these might be from Satellite images, as I say, or aerial images. It can also be over individuals, people, your favorite person or least favorite person. Uh, and you can start coloring them with uh, different um, grids. You can change them so that there are uh, rectangular grids, which is at the top one, or you can turn them into Gaussian, 
uh, so they fade, so they look uh, more blob-like. And in the game, it's very interactive. GeoMap uh, has about 200 different maps around, around the world. Some are cut up into counties and states and provinces. Uh, some are trying to get into uh, smaller regional scales. But you can plot this one. So this is an example of the diabetes rates in the US. So this is an epidemiological heat map. Um, and they're commonly generated. And it essentially produces a, a gradient display and shows you which ones are have the highest incidence of diabetes. You could plot it out, also, almost superimposes with BMI as well. And again, it, it's uh, very interactive and easily adjusted. And then the geo-coordinate one, as I say, you can take basically spatial data, geospatial data from satellite, geological, oceanographic sources and plot things out. Um, and it uses a, what's called a weighted density estimation to get things sort of looking uh, smoother uh, and creating essentially contour maps uh, that are plotted with the heat or color scale um, to map out the information. So these have typically been used in, in oceanographic studies or weather and climate studies uh, to generate heat maps, but you can also do them in epidemiological studies as well. So as I say, it has not a lot to do with a uh, metabolanalyst, but it's, as I say, we found a lot of people were using metabolanalyst specifically for its uh, heat map functions, which were a little limited. And so we've extended that just with this heat mapper. Uh, hopefully it might be of some use to people. So with that, uh, we've wrapped up metabolanalyst. And as I say, I really encourage you to take the, the tutorial uh, and, and hopefully that can give you uh, more opportunities to work with the software.